Right, you're in charge, not me. Well, I'm not going to introduce you, but thank you. I've introduced myself, yes. <laughs> <coughs> thank you for coming. I want to show you something, because I think you all deserve it. Some of you will understand, others won't. <laughs> Miriam? Mariam. 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 Dutch version of Mariam. 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 And well, that was going to be my first question. How's the passport? <laughs> when did you get here? Uh, I got here at 11 o'clock last night, having missed my first Euro star. <laughs> uh, nearly missed the last one, because there was a large crane obstructing the entrance to the car park. And I arrived in the station about seven minutes before the train left. And they said they couldn't let me on, but I cried. And they didn't. <laughs> I said there are thousands of people who will similarly cry in Antwerp if I'm not there. <laughs> and you would have cried, wouldn't you? <laughs> so thank you for supporting me on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you for all the extra effort you've been here. Oh, it was a long you, you day. You did not yes. give up. Oh, yes, there were about three points where I should have given up, but, but didn't. didn't. And uh, I'm glad I didn't. Good. You've been here all day now? You've been signing? I've been, yes, hard at it all morning. Thank you. Yes. An empty glass. How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that makes me feel good. <laughs> yes, uh, I've been quite busy this morning, which is lovely. I met a lot of very nice people. I can see some of them out there. The rest of you have yet to come and say hello. I hope you do. Is your first time here? First time here in Antwerp? My first time in Antwerp, I believe it is, yes. Okay. Unless I came through Antwerp on my way in 1955 <laughs> <laughs> on a school trip to Brussels and Bruges. <laughs> to see the mannequin piece, <laughs> which is all I remember about it. Will we get some time to spend here afterwards? No, I'm on the train back tonight, okay. unless someone steals my passport. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good thing to say. <laughs> so no, I've seen nothing. I saw Brussels briefly, and then I was arrived here at 11 o'clock last night, and I was in this building the same time as you all. And there was a huge queue out there. I hope you weren't queuing for too long. Well, you'll be here in the afternoon as well, right? I'm here till about five o'clock, yes. Okay. You, you, you travel a lot, you visit a lot of cons, right? You go to a lot of conventions? I do go to a lot of conventions, yes. Is it I, fun uh, to meet other people like that and hear yeah, all the stories? I mean, considering it's a job that I did 30 years ago, mm. half a <laughs> lifetime ago, um, I've, well, I can, can never forget it because, ah. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I, every year since I did it, I must have been to a dozen at least. And since the programme came back, the demand for my presence at, and all of my fellow doctors at conventions has grown. Um, it, it's almost got to the point where I'm don't have time to be an actor anymore. Because, you know, in a couple of weeks' time I'm doing one in England and then I'm going to Houston, Texas. I was in New Zealand a couple of months ago. Uh, it's lovely that there are so many people out there who want to celebrate a job that I did 30 years ago and which other actors have done with great distinction before and after. And with all the new fans of the new show respect the doctors from the original... Well, I, I suspect most people out in this room I'm looking at <coughs> became fans of the show when he came back because of Christopher Eccleston and, and, and David, far too good-looking tenants. <laughs> Come on, admit it, girls. <laughs> if David Tennant hadn't done the show, would you have ever watched it? <laughs> Christopher Eccleston too. 
Good, I like your taste. Because <laughs> I thought he was brilliant. He's such a good actor. He is. He I mean, he's point. such a good actor that he, I think he got frightened of being Doctor Who for too long. And he's, he's done so much marvellous stuff and will continue, as indeed, surprisingly for a good looking fellow, as David. <laughs> and I love Matt. I can see the fezzes around. Um, I thought, Matt, when I heard another 22, 23 year olds playing the part, oh, not another child. <laughs> and then along came this 900 year old, 20 year old. And I just thought he was fantastic. He, he was the doctor. And uh, I was sorry when he went, but now I'm excited because a grown up is playing the part. <laughs> He's a Capaldi. <laughs> Who, who's even older than I was when I, well, I think I was 39 or 40 when I played it. Um, he's the same age as William Hartnell was. Um, but uh, from what I'm hearing from my spies in Cardiff, he is very exciting. He has a kind of passion and anger, which has echoes of both William Hartnell and perhaps myself, which I rather like. Because uh, some people got cross, some people got a bit cross with me because I was a bit too angry and dark and grumpy. It'd be nice to have another one to blame. Yeah. Especially in the beginning of your season, you weren't the friendliest of doctors. Well, I suppose um, trying to throttle my companion was evidence of my not being very friendly. It was a brave decision, I think, by the producer. Because Peter Davison, who was immediately before me, had been a rather gentle, passive character. So they decided that the next regeneration would produce somebody who was um, the opposite of that. And he was a kind of frenzied and angry. And uh, I think the, the sad thing in England, you probably won't have encountered this because you've seen it all in one continuous go, was that they showed my first episode and then it was off screen for nine months till the next one. So all they had seen was me trying to kill my companion <laughs> and being a coward. And then right at the end of the episode, I said, I am the doctor, do you like it or not? Yeah. And I winked. And that was the clue that things were going to get better. But an awful lot of the audience in England thought they didn't like the sixth doctor. And they were thinking that for months before they saw the next story, which was um, Tack of the Cybermen. Let's not forget you said, oh, yeah, when Perry showed, her, showed you her new clothes. I did, indeed, <laughs> yes. But, um, so that did, when they came back after the nine months, did the reactions also got better? I, I think the programme was under attack because um, Michael Grade had come to the BBC to take over and didn't like Doctor Who. Um, the, the programme was not held in high esteem at that time by the BBC. And the BBC certainly got, I mean, this is boring stuff, but the money that the programme got from sales didn't go back to the programme making department. It went into another pot, which they didn't get to. So there was no incentive for them to carry on making it to them. Now it's different. Now, from the merchandise you've probably seen, the books, everything else, the BBC has realised that they have something that can make them a lot of money. And they're quite, I was about to say ruthless, wrong word, they're quite um, diligent about ensuring that they make a lot of money out of it. Mm -hmm. So the programme is now loved by the BBC, mm -hmm. which it wasn't in the 1980s. I didn't know that at the time, because, you know, surprisingly, a, a leading actor in a British television series isn't at the heart of decision making. In America they probably are, but in England we are just the people who are paid to come and do the job. What is going on? <laughs> I think it's the cast of Blake 7 probably. <laughs> oh, the one Blake 7 fan here. <laughs> Two, three, five, seven, nine. Right. <coughs> it was you, wasn't it? <laughs> Making that noise, yes. <laughs> Your health. <laughs> and if you can go back before, before Doctor Who, because then you were declared the most hated man in, in Britain. I was. Paul Moroni on the Brothers in the 70s. Yes. 
I did a series in the 70s called The Brothers, or if you uh, lived in Holland, it was hugely popular there, Der Gebruder Hammond, it's called. <laughs> and in Sweden, it was called uh, Arvingana. And in Israel, it was called Aharim. Mm -hmm. And in those four countries, it was their number one program. And we went to visit uh, Israel just after the Six Day War. And Moshe Dayan spoke to me on the phone and said, if the Arabs had invaded when the Brothers was on, they'd have caught us all watching television. <laughs> um, which was very sweet of him. But it was a very successful program. And I was <coughs> voted by the readers of The Sun, <laughs> the most hated man in Britain. Uh, even more than Margaret Thatcher, apparently. So, <laughs> I was pretty evil. So, <laughs> So it was quite a surprise when ten years later I was playing the most loved man on television. Uh, that was rather nice. So I had great fun, yes. And how did you get to be Doctor Who? Because you had a, f a small part before it as a colonel? Yes, I, I played Maxill in a Peter Davison story. I got to shoot Peter, which is one way of getting the part. Um, and I remember saying to my agent, that, what a shame, because if I take a part in Doctor Who, it means I'll never play the Doctor, uh, because it had been established that they always cast the Doctor from actors who'd never been in the show before. And strangely, because I took that part, and the producer liked what I did, um, well, it, we have a, the system we had then, you rehearse for a week, uh, like doing a proper play for the theatre. Yeah. And at the end of that week, you present the whole story for the producer to watch. Because yeah. um, uh, when you record it, it's all out of order, but you did it in story order for the producer. And at the end of it, he came up to me and said, what is this program called? And I said, Doctor Who. So it's not called Maxill then. <laughs> I said, no. He said, you're playing it as if it's about you. I said, well, everybody in their own lives, it's about them. Each one of you here is watching this through your eyes. Maxwell doesn't know there's a television programme being made. Maxwell just knows he thinks the Doctor is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way I was playing it. So he said, well, when Peter's talking and you're standing behind him, <sighs> um, doing that, it is a bit distracting. I said, well, I'll stop doing it then, shall I? I said, thank you. So I toned it down a bit. But as a result of my doing that, when Peter, a couple of months later, said he was going to leave, John Nathan Turner said he thought of me. So, inadvertently, I got myself the part. Interesting, isn't it? I think you were the only one until Peter Capaldi who had it been in it before, right? Yep. And in fact, something I'm quite proud of, I'm the only one who didn't have to do an audition. Okay. Um, I don't think Peter Capaldi did either, but until then, all of them did a screen test or something. Yeah. They just offered it to me. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then look what happened. And did you then have any idea how big this was going to be for you? How would you be here? Well, the one thing they tried to explain to me before I started was, uh, you'll never be able to shake it off. You will always have been. That doesn't bother me. I went to a convention in America... Uh, about two days after it had been announced that I was playing the part. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen a script, I hadn't recorded anything. But I went to a convention in Miami and a few thousand people went berserk mm -hmm. because the new doctor had come to them first. I had nothing to say to them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your costume going to be like? Don't know. <laughs> what are the stories like? Don't know. <laughs> what the Daleks be in it? don't know. <laughs> um, and it's been like that ever since, which is extraordinary. It's lovely. I mean, just think, any other job, what do you do? What's your job? Oh, well, basically customer service and... and well, okay, you're in customer... Well, consulting, yeah. Right, you're in customer service. 30 years after something you, some customer you served, you're walking on the street, they run up to you and say... Are you the guy who did the customer service 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, oh, 
that was brilliant. Uh, your customer service is fantastic. <laughs> Most people don't get that. Uh, we actors are very lucky, which is why I am very impatient when actors go, no, no, I don't have time to sit and talk to you because I'm a very important person. There are a few like that. Most people in my profession are okay, but there are some whose brains were small to start with <laughs> who qu can't quite encompass that you're the same guy as you were before you got the job. And uh, I try and, well, I, I'm forced to remember that. I've got a family who can't even be bothered to watch my doctor who's saying. <laughs> <laughs> briefly mentioned your costume there, just then. My costume? I was very lucky. I was on the inside looking out. <laughs> You're the ones who have to look at it. Um, I've, I've got an affection for it now, because now they've got all these little models of me. Um, all the children, when they want to buy a Doctor Who, buy my one because it's colourful. <laughs> Kids like bright colours. So suddenly, the hated costume has turned to my advantage. Because <laughs> I, I get 0. 0.0001 of a penny for each one sold. When they sell 10,000, I'll get, ooh, five pounds. Did you get to keep it? I've got one, yes. <laughs> oh, the costume? Yeah. Yes, I do have one, one version. There were four made, I think, um, because Obviously, when you're filming, if you're rolling around in mud and they say, sorry, we have to do that scene again, you have to have a clean one available. Yeah. So and I, I was asked to take one home with me because there were people breaking into the costume department <laughs> at the BBC and stealing costumes. An entire Dalek disappeared. <laughs> we were in the studio, we went home, we came back the next day and there was a Dalek missing. <laughs> They're quite big. And they have security on, but somebody had managed to steal a Dalek. Did they ever find it back? Nope. Does someone out there still yeah. a lost Dalek? Is Mind you, everyone claims that there are a lot of Daleks about. And if all the Daleks are supposed to be genuine Daleks from the BBC, there would have been about a thousand of them, which there aren't. And with the new Doctor Who, because they now have more money to spend on it? Oh. To spend more money? <laughs> well, not only do they have more money, but also they can do more with the money. There was, there was a special effect at the, special effect at the beginning <laughs> of Trial of a Time Lord, which was a space station, uh -huh. which was basically a model. You know, the TARDIS landed there, and I stepped out. That's all it was, about five seconds at the beginning. And because of that one model shot, we couldn't do any filming that season. <laughs> <laughs> Overseas filming or anywhere else. It all had to be studio-based, because it was so expensive. Now, a 12-year-old with a computer, right, there's a space station. <laughs> what, a thousand Daleks coming up the sky? Okay, there you are. <laughs> we couldn't do that. The only reason Daleks couldn't climb stairs, well, they, they did once, apparently, in Sylvester's time, which involved about ten burly men. They had a staircase, and they cut a slot down the side of the staircase, put rods through and the, suspended the Dalek on the rods and these men walked out the outside of the set pushing the rods up in the air. <laughs> now, <laughs> Dalek wish <laughs> costs nothing. So not only do they have more money, uh, but they, they can do so much with it. But also there was a charm in the, old, in the older shows with the running up and down I, the corridors and wobbly walls. I am delighted that um, so many people Amazingly, so they prefer the old stuff, and then because it's charming and you know the spirit. I love the new stuff. I, I, all the things that some of the die-hard fans hate, the tiny wimey stuff. <laughs> I love. I, I love not knowing what's going on. <laughs> it's brilliant. In real life, you see things you think I don't understand that, and that's that's what life's about. One of my favourite series ever was Twin Peaks. And he hadn't got a clue what was going on in that. <laughs> and I, I don't I, I, I think you can get bogged down in explaining everything. Sometimes leave us with some question mark question marks. <laughs> it's fun. And then with the 50th anniversary you had the five-ish doctor reboot? The five-ish doctors. Yeah. How many of you have seen that? Doing that. 
that. <laughs> when Peter told me his idea, I thought it was brilliant. And I really have to lift my hat to Peter Davison because and not only is he a very clever actor, but also it turns out he's a very clever writer and relentless in his pursuit of getting it done. The obstacles that were thrown up by gently by the BBC, he managed to steamroll his way through and then even get the people who had been you know, not necessarily in favour of it to appear in it. <laughs> but in the end, I think they had to because otherwise it would look like they weren't good sports. Yeah. And I think it, it was done superbly. He edited it very tightly down to half an hour. And it's just because we were a bit cross that we weren't involved. At that time, we didn't know Tom was in it, uh, which explains why he was reluctant to get involved with us. Um, and we didn't know that Paul was going to do his uh, very good regeneration. Um, but uh, doing the Five-ish Doctors just kind of lanced the boil of disappointment for us. Talking of regenerations, by the way, <coughs> I didn't regenerate, did I? <laughs> did you see me regenerate? <laughs> or did you see Sylvester McCoy wearing a blonde wig? <laughs> right. Therefore, I have not regenerated. <laughs> Therefore, I am still... <laughs> first of a new line <laughs> of ancillary pretend doctors. <laughs> so I am the longest serving doctor, thank you. <laughs> Which also solves the problem of regeneration, because if that means that Peter Capaldi is only number six. <laughs> so you can go on forever. I think <laughs> That's enough, is it? You've had enough. <laughs> At least the air is better in here now. Huh? Slightly. Yeah. Think maybe some questions from the audience. Questions from the audience. Oh, the girl here in front. The um, TARDIS. <laughs> so, Doctor Who, I think for the fans, is more than just the show. I think it's more like family, a way of living. The show means so much to us, but what does Doctor Who mean to you? Apart from all the conventions and taking pictures and... Well, it means the same thing. I mean, I have been lucky enough to be one of now 12 people who have been a part of that. And I... <coughs> it helps me... Um, you may find this hard to believe, but as a young man, I didn't have any confidence. As a young actor, I struggled with confidence. You know, I, um, I, I pretended to have confidence, but I didn't have confidence, really. A lot of actors will tell you that. I was very shy at school, all those things. You wouldn't think it now, seeing me talking to you. But the one thing that Doctor Who has done for me has made me realise, I look at all the other Doctors, and I think they're all brilliant. Therefore, I think I must have achieved some right to be with them. Therefore, it has given me the confidence to think that my life as a professional actor has at least had some point. And hopefully, even though they... <coughs> don't go out of their way to show it, my four daughters will one day be proud of me. Um, I suspect they possibly are, but I quite like the fact that they're cool about it. Only one of them has actually watched any of my Doctor Who's. <laughs> <laughs> Only well, yeah, I will one day. In fact, uh, they were all too young to watch it, or not born, uh, when I was doing it. And when it came back, and they'd been watching Christopher Eccleston, one of them said to me, Hang on, Doc, is that the programme you did? <laughs> I said, yes. For years I've been saying, do you want to watch this? No. <laughs> you were do that Doctor Who? Yes! <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's given me some kudos in my home. Well, I might go to the passport office in Peterborough <laughs> four days ago. Or I might go back to when 
Michael Graves' parents met each other and convinced them it wasn't a good idea. Um, and then I'd still be playing the Doctor for real. Uh, oh, there's lots of places I go back to. They're all very selfish. Um, I might go back to... No, I, I don't believe... People say, would I'd go back to 1983 and start it all over again. But no, the past deserves to remain where it is. Because without the past that we've all had, we wouldn't have been all together in this room right now. Who knows what would have happened. So we should let the past sit where it is, which is a good precept for a time lord, isn't it? <laughs> uh, do you have a white shirt? Do you? Yeah. Did I design it myself? Did you work on the project? Did I design it myself? <laughs> they asked me what costume I would like to wear. What I described is almost exactly what Christopher Eccleston got. <laughs> and at the time they said, no, black's too like the master, you can't have that. I said, but surely the doctor is not unintelligent. The doctor will know that there are many occasions in his business life when being unnoticed, blending into the background, would be useful. Um, and they went, mm, yeah. And they gave me what I got. <laughs> Which always struck me as daft. At least with Big Finish. You are aware of Big Finish? Yes. At least on audio, I've got a new costume. <laughs> on audio, isn't it wonderful? From the new series, there are quite a few I like. I'm, I'm rather partial um, to, now what are they called? The agents. No, the ones that fart. <laughs> <laughs> what are they called? <laughs> the Slitheen, yeah. Oh, what a great monster. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> um, no, the angels are rubbish. <laughs> Let me explain why. It was David Tennant's story, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> okay, you're an angel. <laughs> Don't blink, wink. I want to see that on a t-shirt. Don't blink, wink. <laughs> But aside from that, they're pretty scary. But for me, the scariest are the silence. They're something that, when you've got away from them, you can't remember what happened. Is a very, I'd love if, to have that ability myself. <laughs> what a fun life I'd have. <laughs> um, but there are, a lot of, there are a lot of brilliant new ones. Um, uh, I have to say that hats off to Stephen Moffat, because his imagination, the stories that I always remember the most are the ones he's written. And for me, the best moment ever in Doctor Who was in that two-parter, which was um, ending with the Doctor Dances. The first one was called The Empty Child. And right at the end, Eccleston says, correct, everybody lives. Which I've, even now saying it, I get a shiver down my spine. And when I watched it, I got a real shiver down my spine. Because for me, that sums up what Doctor Who should be. I know I didn't adhere to that myself as a doctor. <laughs> I went around shooting cyber controllers and allegedly pushing people into acid baths, which I didn't do. <laughs> I just got out of the way and they ran into them. <laughs> but that aside, I think that's what Doctor Who should be about. It, it's never possible, of course, because in order to have an exciting story, there has to be danger. And danger is not credible if it doesn't actually happen occasionally in a story. So everybody can't always live, but when they do, that's a plus for Doctor Who, I think. Well, I've written 
I've written a few Doctor Who short stories, three or four of which are in my book, which I've sold out today, unfortunately. Um, Galley Morfley, it's called. It's a book of short stories, four of which are Doctor Who stories, like uh, um, meeting the Brigadier and not knowing it, and things like that. Um, was, I'm quite pleased with them. And Wings of a Butterfly is one of them, yeah. And I wrote a comic novel once, too, called Age of Chaos, which is around somewhere. Yes, I would, do you know, I, I keep saying I'm going to write a big Finnish story, and I keep not doing it, because writing takes up an awful lot of time. Whereas I turn up and record a story, I do it in two days. I'm doing one this coming week with Nicola. Uh, writing one takes a lot longer than that. So, but I've got an idea in my head for a story. But the trouble is, uh, when you write a story for Big Finish, they, they want you to give them a plot outline and break down. I can't be bothered with that, so I'm going to write it. And if they don't like it, then I'll keep it. And, and it's tough. <laughs> but if anyone knows my doctor, it should be me, shouldn't it? Is that it? Is it? Oh, you've been very lovely. Oh. But you've got somebody even more interesting coming. Who's next? David Warner. David Warner. Now, let me tell you a quick story. <laughs> I was a drama student. I used to go to Stratford upon Avon a lot. I went on the first night of David Warner's Hamlet. I'm not sure what year it was. 1963, 4. Uh, and it changed my life because it was the best, not only the best Hamlet I'd ever seen, it was five hours long on the first night and it felt like two hours. It was cut subsequently. Um, he can fill you in on the detail. I can't remember now. But I just thought he was magnificent. And he came to do a big finish a couple of years ago and I was a bit tongue-tied. Um, I still am with him because for me, uh, he was one of the finest actors of his generation. So you're in for a treat. He's, he's, he's quite a shy man, I think. But he is a, his Hamlet was astonishing. Absolutely so. I'm sorry. I don't even think it's been recorded, so you'll probably never see it. But as a young actor, it was one of the most exciting things I've ever seen. So enjoy him. Thank you.